you have to look at who owns the food industry and the pharmaceutical industry own the food industry. So the food industry wants to make you sick and ill by putting all these chemicals in that rot your body and make you ill. So they then can give you tablets to make you better, which don't because it's all about Illuminati industries making money. But we gave our power away. We started not growing our own vegetables, started to give our power away to other people saying, we'll make this food for you. You don't want to cook your own food? We'll make this for you. And then we didn't start questioning what's in this stuff. And they started putting all kinds of crap in it. I'm a raw foodist myself. Life is for a Sunday morning. <laughs> but I, I don't eat meat because that's pumped full of chemicals and fear. And why would you want to eat cortisol and fear and put all that in your body and it will rot your body, make you ill? We're seeing a society that not only has a lot more people of lower IQ, but a lot fewer people of higher IQ. In other words, a dumbing down, a chemical dumbing down of society. So everyone's sort of mediocre. That leaves them dependent on government because they can't excel. We have these people of lower IQ who are totally dependent. Then we have this mass of people who are going to believe anything they're told because they can't really think clearly. And very few people of very high IQ who have good cognitive function who can figure this all out. And that's what they want. So, you know, you can kind of piece it together as to why they are so insistent in spending so many hundreds of millions of dollars of propaganda money to dumb down society. Has America been used to deceive the nations of the world? Is there a lot of deception coming out of America that is deceiving the entire world? And it says, by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. All nations. All nations have been deceived by the United States of America. And I mean, when it comes to fashion and clothing, who do you think sets the pace? Who do you think sets the standard? Exactly. United States of America, New York. I mean, th this nation produces the music that the world listens to. I mean, if you go, look, I've been all over Europe. I've been to what, 11 countries in Europe. And in Europe, I don't care what country you're in, you listen to the radio, you're hearing American music. I mean, they don't even always understand the words because it's, e it's all in English. Of course, a lot of the young people in, in Europe all speak English. But when you're in Europe, I mean, they know all the American bands, all the American rock and roll and pop music. They listen to it over there. I mean, it is the most popular music all over the world. And, and not just the music, what about the movies? Where are all the movies made? Hollywood, California. And the movies that are made in Hollywood go around the entire world and are translated into every language on the planet. These Hollywood movies are all embedded with the devil's messages they're all embedded with what the devil wants people to think and believe and all of his agenda and his philosophy. It's anti-family, it's anti-tradition, it's against everything that is good and righteous and wholesome and godly and it's promoting fornication, it's promoting promiscuity, it's promoting adultery, it's promoting drunkenness, it's promoting drug use, it's promoting violence and these movies that are put out in the United States of America have been used to brainwash the entire world. The TV shows of America have brainwashed the world. The rock and roll music of America has enamored and, and enchanted and brainwashed the world. But look, as soon as American influence comes through TV, through the music, through the movies, you know, and you go to the big cities in these countries and, and the more access they have to TV, internet, movies, what they, they start dressing like American girls. You know, they start acting like American girls, which is not, which is not a righteous model. I mean, what is going to happen in our country in the next couple of years? I mean, isn't it a scary thought? I mean, it's so bizarre what's happened over the last 10 years and we see it accelerating.
I'll tell you that the number one problem in Hollywood was and is and always will be pedophilia. I can tell you that the number one problem in Hollywood was and is and always will be pedophilia. That's the biggest problem for children in this industry. I'm going to explain to you something that you weren't aware of, but that you should be aware of. It will demonstrate the degree of propaganda and preparation that those who are bringing about the new world order are engaged in in order to prepare the public. And a good portion of it, ladies and gentlemen, is aimed directly at the children of the world. If you took your children to see The Lion King, you will be especially interested in tonight's broadcast. For tonight, I'm going to give you the true meaning of that movie, and I'm going to tell you exactly what was taught to your children. Even though they may not realize it, even though they may not understand it at their tender age, and even though most of the parents in the world who have attended the showing of The Lion King had no idea whatsoever what it was that they were watching tonight, you're going to find out. And when you do find out, I can assure you, most of you will be angry. Walt Disney was a 33rd degree Freemason of the Scottish Rite. Disneyland in Anaheim, California has an address of 1313 Anaheim Boulevard. Unless you understand the symbolic meaning of the mysteries and the symbology of revenge of the Templars, you may not. You may not give too much importance to that address, but those of us who know do. Walt Disney was a very famous Anglophile who was in bed with the FBI and the intelligence community and spied for most of his life on his fellow movie makers in Hollywood. We know that in 1958, for one year, there was a colloquium of the greatest scientific minds in the United States gathered over several meetings during that year to discuss the exploration and colonization of the moon and Mars. At every one of those meetings were representatives of the Walt Disney Studios. Now, you may not really understand what this is all about yet, but I can assure you, before tonight is over, you'll understand at least a part of it. Escute bem, com o nível de bruxaria, satanismo, pornografia e espiritismo nos vídeos da Disney. Eu somente lhe vou dizer alguns nessa noite porque o tempo não permite. Porque eu quero que a sua casa seja livre como a nossa casa foi livre. Por exemplo, no vídeo de Marmay, como se chama Marmay, The Little Marmay, aqui no Brasil. Lê na sereia, veja aqui meu querido. Quero que você veja a capa da sereia. Se você parou para pensar... E para examinar na capa, a coluna terceira da mão direita para a esquerda é o membro genital, o membro sexual do homem parado para cima. Este vídeo de Little Marmay é um vídeo de pornografia infantil. Detrás da música, onde diz, kiss the girl, kiss the girl, beije a moça, beije a moça, há um grupo jamaicano falando palavras africanas para amaldiçoar a cada criança que está escutando o vídeo. Por exemplo, no vídeo de Aladdin, como se diz Aladdin? Aladino. Se você para o vídeo em slow motion, devagar, não sei o que chama, slow motion, você coloca devagar, você verá que ele diz tão rápido, mas você não pode entender. Ele diz... Good teenagers, take off your clothes. Ele está dizendo, crianças, boas e adolescentes, tire a sua roupa. 
Tem um vídeo que tem causado sensação tremenda, se chama Pocahontas. Você sabe o que quer dizer a palavra Pocahontas? Você já estudou essa palavra indígena, o que quer dizer Pocahontas? É uma palavra indígena com dois sentidos. Poca, espírito. Hontas, abismo. Espírito invocado do abismo. Quando você diz Pocahontas, você está chamando o diabo ao lado do seu lado e ao lado dos seus filhos. Isso que a Disney está ensinando, pornografia, espiritismo, satanismo e destruição aos nossos filhos. Há um vídeo chamado The Lion King, o rei leão, o leão rei. A revista Time disse que é o vídeo mais sujo, mais perverso e carregado de violência que nenhum outro vídeo a Disney jamais produziu. Que as crianças que olham o Lion King hoje serão os assassinos amanhã. Você sabe quem produziu o vídeo de Lion King? Foi um homem homossexual que já morreu de uh, AIDS? AIDS, em Nova York, se chamou John Smith. Ele que criou, segundo o um filme, o leão que caminha afeminado. Onde é que você viu um leão afeminado? A música do Lion King é da nova era de Shir McLean. Por isso as crianças ficam vidradas. Porque a música é uma música do inferno. É uma música dedicada ao demônio. E se você para o vídeo de Lion King, o, o rei leão, o leão rei, em slow motion, quando ele pega com as patas no chão e os, as partículas do pó que se levantam no meio da televisão, forma a palavra sex. S e X, sexo. E você ainda crê que Disney é entretenimento familiar? Do you really believe that? Você crê que a Disney é para crianças? E vou apresentar isso, você nunca viu na sua vida. É a reportagem do Dr. James Dobson, no programa chamado Focus on the Family, é Enfoque a Família. Os livros dele estão traduzidos em português. Está Mickey Mouse apresentando o último vídeo da Disney. Sabe que você quer saber o nome? Growing Up Gay. Crescendo homossexual. Agora a Disney criou dois Mickey Mouse homossexuais e duas Minnie Mouse lésbicas. Aqui neste vídeo de Growing Up Gay, o porta-voz da Disney convida a todos os adolescentes homens a explorar o maravilhoso mundo da homossexualidade. Isso é Disney. Michael Esner, o dono da Disney... De 60% das ações que ele tem, ele deixou a sua mulher em Burbank, perto da minha casa na Califórnia, e se casou com um homem homossexual três meses atrás no Disney World Orlando, Florida. Você não sabe o que é Disney. É um império satânico, feito com uma assombrosa precisão para destruir a tua casa e para destruir os teus filhos. Vou lhe dar um conselho nessa noite. Destrua esses vídeos e salve a sua casa da maldição do dia de amanhã.
If you want to turn me on I can tell you that the number one problem in Hollywood was and is and always will be pedophilia. I can tell you that the number one problem in Hollywood was and is and always will be pedophilia. That's the biggest problem for children in this industry. Take for example Walt Disney, right? And many people that will preach against the TV, they'll preach against the movies, they'll preach against Hollywood because it's obvious that that stuff is bad. But then they'll say, well, well we watch Disney movies. And I've been to the home of preachers and Christians who would never watch TV or the movies, but yet they have the whole library of the Walt Disney movies. You know those white plastic cases, and they have them all lined up, and I mean, they have tons of them lined up, scores. I don't know how many there are, but there's hundreds of them. They have them lined up and lined up, and they have their kids watching those movies all day long. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to prove to you right now that those movies are wicked. Say, what? Disney movies? Come on, you're crazy, they're rated G. Well, let's see. First of all, did you know this? Did you know that Disney movies are filled with subliminal messages? Subliminal messages. Now, we're ta- what are we talking about tonight? Sorcery. What are we talking about tonight? Uh, getting inside your mind and messing with you. Uh, controlling your thought process by... by uh, supernatural means or demonic means or hey i'm gonna tell you something disney movies are filled with subliminal messages and you say oh that's a hoax i've seen it with my own eyes when i was a teenager i had a friend of mine sit me down at his house and show me the subliminal messages in the disney movies they're filled with subliminal messages let me give you some examples the lion king filled with subliminal messages Okay, all throughout the movie, there are pornographic pictures hidden in the movie. Like, you'll be watching the movie, and just for a few seconds, something filthy will come up. Like, off to the side, there will be some kind of a, you know, reproductive anatomy will, will pop up. You know, over here. And then and then over here, there's this one point where the lion, you know, he, he kind of goes like, like this. And a cloud of dust comes up and just spells the word sex. And the word sex is, is put in the Lion King movie subliminally, literally, hundreds of times. Hundreds of times the, 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 the shapes on the screen will spell the word. And I've seen it. I mean, I had my friend sit me down at his house and pausing the movie, showing me the word S-E-X popping up on the screen at different times because he knew where they were. And he would show me these things. Nabokov's multi-layered interrogation of the pedophile secret underworld extended to the movies. Anticipating queries raised by more recent critics such as Marion Sinclair, the author detected unsavory currents beneath Hollywood's glittering surface. With Lolita, he took special delight in mocking suspect scenes found in Shelley Temple films. The iconic child star, Shelley Temple, was born on April 23, 1928. For four years, during the Great Depression, this talented little girl remained America's number one box office attraction. Shirley began her long film career at age three, when she starred in an all-child cast Baby Burlesque series, produced and directed by Jack Hayes and Charles Lamont. Lamont is widely credited with being Shirley's discoverer. During the 1930s, the Baby Burlesque short film screened regularly before the main feature. Commonly interpreted as innocent, fun-filled spoofs on leading actresses of the stage and cinema, the Baby Burlesque films are in fact replete with disturbing slapstick jokes and sly innuendos. As the leading lady, Shirley Temple frequently played a prostitute or nightclub performer. In Glad Rags to Riches, she was La Belle Diaperina, a dancer at the Lullaby Lobster Palace. Her beau, Elmer, 
fails to impress when he chomps down hard on an enormous pickle. In War Babies, Pipsqueak Shirley played the diaper-clad harlot Gloria. The toddler soldiers hanging around Pete's Buttermilk Cafe compete for her attention by presenting her with enormous lollipops. Titillating side entertainment is provided by the tap-dancing African-American boy who performs a slow strip tease down to his underwear. Down on all fours, another toddler sits open-mouthed beneath an overturned baby bottle. A large sign in the background states, Sour Milk. When things go awry, Gloria comes to the rescue by pulling a rubber glove from her purse and attaching it to a keg of sweet milk. As the youngster suckles away, a man can be heard moaning rather than mooing on the accompanying soundtrack. Shirley's prostitute status is ultimately confirmed when a patron triumphantly picks his teeth with a bobby pin that held up her diapers. Shirley again played a call girl in politics in Washington. Hired by the nipple and anti-caster oil lobby, she sets out to corrupt a new bumpkin senator. When Senator Claude Buster succumbs to her wily charms, Polly confirms her sex for higher status by stating, Claude Buster's fall from grace sees him go down on a giant cake, bizarrely spewing white icing behind him like a lawnmower. In the last baby burlesque film, Kid in Africa, Shirley played the cannibal civilizing Christian missionary Madame Cradlebait. Attired in hot pants and a white safari hat, the pistol wielding Madame journeys through the jungle accompanied by an obedient troop of African coolies. During a raid, she is captured and stuck in a cliché cooking pot. After seasoning her with salt, the cannibal chief asks the telephone operator to connect him to extension 342. After Madame Cradlebait is rescued by a miniature Tarzan, the action abruptly shifts to an eerie post-honeymoon scene outside the Squaldorf Hotel. An African child carrying a weary nipple cafe specials billboard tanks up at the last chance filling station by sucking on the end of a gas pump. The mouthfuls he swallows are conveniently monitored on the gulp meter standing nearby. In case you missed it, here's a longer close-up of the pump's nozzle. Nabokov directly linked Kid in Africa's subliminal pedophile code to Lolita via a strategy of reiterated themes and numerology. At the Enchanted Hunter's Hotel, Humbert and his nymphette bunk down in room 342. Throughout the night, Humbert's sleep is disturbed by the sound of a flushing toilet, a tainted reminder of the ever-popular honeymoon trip to the Niagara Falls. After Lolita escapes with Quilty, Humbert searches 342 hotels and motels in a vain attempt to track down his elusive nymphette. Nabokov also parodied Charles Lamont's 1934 short film, Managed Money. Stelway Shirley sets off with her teenage brother Sonny through a cactus-infested Californian desert. En route, they are bewitched by a luxurious mansion that turns out to be a Fata Morgana, or optical illusion. When they stop to prospect for gold, Shirley backs into a prickly pear. A man suddenly pops out from behind a saguaro and starts laughing. In Lolita's lampooning retake, Humbert dreams of spinning onto California to the Mexican border to mythical bays, saguaro deserts, Fata Morganas. Shirley may have left her career as a child prostitute behind after she was signed up by 20th Century Fox in 1934, but the suspicious scenes did not disappear altogether. Cast as an orphan, motherless child or runaway, the plot lines of Shirley's feature films now revolved around children's institutions and custody battles. Some guardians displayed an odd talent for meeting untimely ends. In bright eyes, Shirley's mother is run over by a speeding vehicle as she crosses the road to catch a bus. Her stern governess meets an equally grisly end in Poor Little Rich Girl. The coincidental car accident theme was ridiculed in Lolita when Charlotte Hayes is run over on the way to posting a letter that would expose Humbert's perverse interest in her daughter. 
In bright eyes, Shirley dances coquettishly down the aisle under the too appreciative gaze of her aviator pals. Brandishing huge lollipops, the all-male crew proceed to maul Shirley. They pick her up, shove a box of Cracker Jacks under one arm and press her face into an oversized cake that leaves traces of white icing around her mouth. In a mocking reenactment, Humbert complains of catching Little Limp Low dripping a look in the direction of a friendly mechanic and bursting into a perfect love song of wisecracks as soon as he turns his back to buy a lollipop. Shirley often comforts her male co-stars in a too adult fashion. Sometimes she fiddles flirtatiously with their ties. Shades of incest creep into poor little rich girl as Shirley lies cradled in her father's arms stroking his face and singing. Incest seems a safer option than being stalked by a creepy child predator who tries to lure her with peppermint candy. In Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm, Shirley loses her voice and is examined by a doctor behind a locked door without an accompanying adult. The Prave choreography is seen in Captain January, where Shirley has a close encounter with her dancing co-star, Buddy Ebsen. The gratuitous slapstick gags continue. Some of Shirley's studio portraits also present her in a distinctly inappropriate manner. Further signs of a covert pedophilic agenda are discernible in Curly Top, where millionaire benefactor Edward Morgan is utterly bewitched by his orphan ward. Crooning is also new to me. He eagerly anticipates the new thrills on offer in my wonderland. Morgan dreams of an utterly naked, cherubic Shirley gilded in gold paint. Although this scene was either cut or censored, in her autobiography, Shirley recalled fearing death by toxic asphyxiation as she plunged a mythical dart into Morgan's heart. Morgan's hallucinations continue as all the paintings in his study are suddenly haunted by Shirley's image. In Lolita, the piano scene is comically revisited when Quilty stops to sing a few hysterical sonorities accompanied by soundtrack snorts as Humbert chases him around Pavel Mansion. Why, we may ask, is Shirley's dress shorter at the back than the front as she pirouettes on top of the grand piano? And what exactly was the purpose of the scene where Shirley creeps into Morgan's bedroom then jiggles up and down on his stomach? At least Denmark had the sense to ban Curly Top from specified corruption upon its release. Curly Top makes use of the Telltale Spider Code. This theme emerges after Morgan buys a hula dress and ukulele for his tiny ward, and we see Shirley dancing in a grass skirt. A short while later, Shirley is lying on the beach reading a comic strip. The camera zooms in on the cartoon, where a man yells, There's a big spider in your skirt! to a woman in a hula dress. A voyeuristic close-up of Shirley's buttocks ensues as she rocks back and forth on a seahorse in a swimsuit that is conveniently too small for her. Nabokov parodied this scene by having Lolita swipe the comics from Humbert before flopping down on her belly to read on the piazza. This time it is Humbert who rocks back and forth as the girl's smell at once set my manhood astir. Despite her enormous popularity, Shirley Temple did have some critics in the 1930s. American film critic Gilbert Seldes compared Shirley to Mae West, the reigning sex goddess, and recommended her directors face a firing squad at daybreak. Seldes thought Shirley's dimpled cuteness had very little to do with her real power, because at her good moments, something like a growl of satisfaction arises from the men in the audience. Across the Atlantic, British writer Graham Greene similarly argued that Shirley attracted male audiences for all the wrong reasons. In his review of Captain January, Green queried the director's motivations, asserting the camera was being used in a salacious manner to provoke disreputable enjoyments. In his 1937 review of Wee Willy Winky, published by Night and Day magazine, Green again went on the attack, insisting, Infancy with her is a disguise. Her appeal is more secret and more adult. Her neat and well-developed rump 
twisted in the tap dance, her eyes had a sidelong searching coquetry. This time, 20th Century Fox retaliated, winning substantial damages from Green for implying it had procured Miss Temple for immoral purposes. Nearly two decades later, Graham Greene was an early reader and a fan of Lolita. He must have appreciated the novel's little recognized critique of the Hollywood Shirley Temple industry. In his review, Greene praised Lolita as one of the best books published in 1955. His comments sparked a heated debate over morality and censorship that eventually culminated in Lolita hitting number one on the bestsellers list in the UK and America. Shirley Temple's legacy lingers on in her movies, books, dolls, figurines, and other collectibles. Questions about the motivations of her Hollywood directors are rarely raised. Nabokov very aptly summed up these anxieties when he had Humbert parade past Lolita in my adult disguise, a great big handsome hunk of movie land manhood. I can tell you that the number one problem in Hollywood was and is and always will be pedophilia. I can tell you that the number one problem in Hollywood was and is and always will be pedophilia. That's the biggest problem for children in this industry. The casting couch even applies to children. Oh yeah. I can tell you that the number one problem in Hollywood was and is and always will be pedophilia. I can tell you that the number one problem in Hollywood was and is and always will be pedophilia. That's the biggest problem for children in this industry. The casting couch even applies to children. Oh yeah. Not in the same way. It's all done under the radar. Nobody talks about pedophilia. It's the big secret. And it's widespread? Oh yeah. I was surrounded by them when I was 14 years old surrounded. I can tell you that the number one problem in Hollywood was and is and always will be pedophilia. Literally. Didn't even know it. It wasn't until I was old enough to realize what they were and what they wanted and what they were about and the types of people that were surrounding me till I went, oh my god, they were everywhere like vultures. There's one person to blame in the death of Corey Haim and that person happens to be a Hollywood mogul and that person needs to be exposed but unfortunately I can't be the one to do it. But the person that knows who did it and knows who he is, is watching right now, I guarantee you. Hmm. Yeah. Intriguing. Yeah. There was a circle of older men that surrounded themselves around this group of kids. Hmm. And they all had either their own power or connections to great power in the entertainment industry. And it's widespread? Oh, yeah. I was surrounded by them when I was 14 years old. Surrounded. Literally. Didn't even know it. It wasn't until I was old enough to realize what they were and what they wanted and what they were about and the types of people that were surrounding me till I went, oh my God, they were everywhere like vultures. You let me get around in my life, man, raped, so to speak, when I was about 14 and a half, and I'm saying this right now. What'd you do, man, when you saw that going down when I was 14 to me? What'd you do? You knew about it. You want to talk about the truth? Okay, well, then let's talk about the truth. I was being molested at the same time by somebody else. What'd you do? You know, there's a lot of good people in this industry, but there's also a lot of really, really sick, corrupt people in this industry. And there are people in this industry who have gotten away with it for so long that they feel they're above the law. Hmm. And that's got to change. That's got to stop. I can tell you that the number one problem in Hollywood was and is and always will be pedophilia. I need to wake up. I need to get a clear mind I need to wake up Try to remind I need, I need to wake up Stand up I need to get a clear mind
need to get a clear mind I need to wake up Try to remind I need, I need to wake up Stand up I need to get a clear mind Get that clear mind